like to talk a little bit about the meaning of Pentecost. We've just celebrated Pentecost Sunday, and it was a long journey from Lent to Easter to the Ascension to Pentecost, and pretty soon we're going to begin ordinary time. And what I'd like to talk about is, is Pentecost just a feast day? Is it just something we remember that happened in the early church? Is it just something that we correctly understand it as the beginning of the church, the launching of the church, or is it something that's supposed to be available to us today? Is this something that just happened to the 120 people in the upper room uh, and, and happened in the early church, but is it supposed to happen today? So I'd like to talk about what's revealed to us in the Word of God about the purpose of the first Pentecost and how we can actually connect to that power of Pentecost today. In fact, one of the things that most people don't even know is that every single pope since Pope John the 23rd and St. Paul the 6th and St. John Paul the 2nd and Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, every single one of them has fervently prayed that the Lord would send us a new Pentecost. And boy, do we ever need it. Do we, do we ever need people to come alive in Jesus, to come alive in, in confidence in the truth of the gospel, to come alive and and, and, and just be able to be a witness to Jesus and to love Jesus and to draw closer to him like the disciples did on the day of Pentecost. So let's take a look at what the Word of God reveals to us about the meaning of Pentecost and how that can be more real in our life today. We know one of the things that is true in all four Gospels, John the Baptist introduces Jesus as the one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit. And this is pretty significant. Uh, like, for example, in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who's coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. There's a, there's a fire connected with Pentecost. In fact, uh, when you talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, the some of the Greek words used in the New Testament are energia, uh, dunamis, you know, where our word dynamic comes from, where our word energy comes from. So something that brings something to alive in us that kind of propels us in the Christian life. And then a very important text, Luke chapter 24, just before Jesus ascends to the Father, he goes over the scriptures one last time with the disciples saying, look, it's all about me. It's all pointing to what happened. It's written that the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Well, you know, there's been a lot of confusion in the church. There's a lot of, a lot of division. There's a lot of arguing about what we really need to do. And we certainly need orthodoxy. We certainly need correct doctrine. And we certainly need reverent liturgies. And we certainly need uh, unity amongst ourselves. But none of those things can really accomplish the purpose for which they've been created without this mysterious thing where Jesus says, don't try to carry out the mission until something else happens, a real infusion of the Holy Spirit, until you're clothed with power from on high. So what is, what is this mysterious being clothed with power from on high? We, we find out a little bit more about it in the Acts of the Apostles. Sure enough, Jesus is about ready to ascend to the Father. He, he's been with them for 40 days. And then he said, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of my father about which you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, most scripture scholars say that what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit is to be brought fully into new life in Jesus Christ, life in the Spirit, life in Jesus, not just knowing about Jesus, not just knowing about the Spirit, but being in the Lord, incorporated into Him. And so what we talk about today is baptism, is confirmation, is the Eucharist, the sacraments of Christian initiation, or what scholars say baptism in the Spirit is really all about. 
but they're not just supposed to be sacraments that we kind of check off the list and say we've got it, we've got our sacraments now, but they're supposed to actually enable us to experience the power of the Spirit in a way that energizes our whole Christian life. St. Thomas Aquinas says you can actually have received valid sacraments but the grace of them, the power of them, the fruits of them be kind of blocked because of the lack of all kinds of things in our life. If we are not truly repenting, if we're not truly turning away from our sin, uh, we're blocking the grace of the sacrament. If we're really not hungry for God, if we don't want the graces of the sacrament to be stirred up in us, we're going to be diminishing their power and their effectiveness. So let's go on. The disciples still don't get it. The next question they ask Jesus is, are you going to throw out the Romans now? Are you going to take over now? Are we going to kind of come on in victory into Jerusalem and take over and kick the Romans out? He says, no, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has established, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you'll carry out the mission. Okay, they have the first novena. A lot of us just finished the novena to the, to the Holy Spirit, a novena preparing for Pentecost. At the end of the first novena, the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples, Mary and the apostles, and 120 of them in the upper room, and they rushed out into the street and started praising the Lord and declaring the wonderful deeds of God and sending his son Jesus on the earth to forgive us our sins and reopen the path to heaven. So they talk amongst themselves and they say, uh, well, what could be going on? And one person said, uh, they must be drunk. They're acting like they're drunk people. So that's a little clue about what can happen to us about getting excited about Jesus. It's good to get excited about Jesus. You know, we can't live in that state of excitement all the time. But from time to time, we should clap our hands and raise our hands and make a joyful noise to the Lord because God is so good. In fact, when Jesus was coming to the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. His disciples were shouting out, and, you know, really celebrating. And the, the Pharisees said, Master, quiet down your disciples. They're making a scene. And Jesus says, if they were quiet, the stones would be crying out. It is so amazing. It is so wonderful that the word became flesh. It is so amazing. It's so wonderful that God would send his own son to lead us back to paradise, to open up the door for us so that we can return home to our father's house. So Peter gets up and he says, no, we're not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. But what you see and hear, notice the language. There's a certain visibility to Pentecost. It's something you can experience, something you can see, something you can feel. What you see and hear is the promise of God being fulfilled. This is what the whole history of Israel has been about. This is what all the Psalms and the prophets and the law of Moses, they're all pointing to the fulfillment of God's promise by sending a Messiah, the suffering servant who will take away the sins of the world. After he finishes preaching, it says they're cut to the heart. It was powerful preaching and the power of the Holy Spirit with true conviction. And then they said, what shall we do? And what, what Peter then said is, repent every one of you and be baptized in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you too will receive this gift of the Spirit. And this is a very important sentence because it's for you. It's for your children. It's for everybody that God is drawing to himself. So there's been a lot of theological debate over the last 2,000 years when people haven't experienced much of the movement of the Holy Spirit. And some theologians would speculate, saying, well, that was just for the early church to get it started. We don't need that now because we have a book that tells us what the truth is. Or some people will say, well, that was just for the leaders of the church, and that was just for great saints through the history of the church who, who worked miracles and, and amazing things happened to. But that's not true. That's not what Peter said. That's not what the Word of God revealed. What Peter said is, this is for you. It's for everybody that God is drawing towards himself. It's for your children. It's for everybody. I think of that wonderful uh, video that's going around, the blessing, you know, from the United Kingdom about this is for you, and may the blessing be upon you and your children and their children and their children. God wants to bless us in the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, how do you stir up the grace of the sacraments? By just doing what Peter said. 
by repenting, by taking a look at our lives and saying, is there anything in my life that's taking me away from the Lord? Is there anything in my life that's distracting me? Am I, is there too much of the world in my life? Is there too much television in my life? Is there too much uh, news in my life? Am I spending enough time in prayer? Is, am I spending time really treasuring the Word of God? Am, am I spending time with brothers and sisters who can help inspire me? Am I doing spiritual reading? Am I doing things to feed my hunger for God? Because the more we hunger for Him, the more He can give Himself to us. Another thing is just believing the Word of God. Believe what the Scripture says. This is for you. The grace of the Holy Spirit is for you, not just in a lukewarm kind of never never experienced kind of way, but it's for you to know the love of God poured out into your hearts through the Holy Spirit. Now, another way in which this is really emphasized time and time again is every time in the rest of the Acts of the Apostles where a new group of converts come into the church, the apostles are explicitly concerned about them coming into the same experience as they did on the day of Pentecost. For example, on um, chapter 8, the uh, Samaritans, those, those controversial people that the Jews didn't like very much, the Samaritans accepted the gospel and believed in Jesus Christ and became baptized. But then it said, the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon any of them. So they received the Spirit, they were Christians, but not in the measure, not in the fullness that the apostles knew the Lord wanted to do. So Peter and John went down to them and laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon the magician saw that uh, the Holy Spirit fell on them through the laying on of the apostles' hands, uh, he said, how much would it cost for me to do that? Wouldn't it be great if uh, sorcerers and magicians followed around our bishops when they confirmed people saying, wow, the Holy Spirit really fell. Well, what's going on there? How, how can I do that? Then in Acts chapter 10, pretty amazing, pretty important. Cornelius and his household, uh, a, a non-Jew, a, a Gentile, but, but devoted to the Lord, uh, honoring God, fearing God. Uh, he gets a visit from an angel saying, I'm going to send you some people who's going to really tell you the way of salvation for you and your household. In the meantime, Peter gets a vision about unclean animals, and the Lord says, take and eat. And uh, Peter says, I'm a good Jew. I can't eat unclean animals. And the Lord says, Peter, I'm expanding your understanding of what's going on. We're going to not just keep this for Jews. This is for everybody in the world. This is for Gentiles. And I want you to go to this Gentile's house. He's been prepared to receive you. I want you to tell him about Jesus. So while Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the word. The Jewish Christians that were there were just totally amazed astounded quote that the gift of the Holy Spirit should, should have been poured out on the Gentiles too for they could hear them speaking in tongues and glorifying God so again uh, there's a manifestation of charisms you don't have to speak in tongues in order to have the Holy Spirit but it's one of the gifts that scripture says is available like Paul says I speak in tongues more than all of you I want you all to speak in tongues those who speak in tongues speak mysteries unto God you don't understand what you're saying but something's been released in your soul and then he says, how can we withhold the water for baptizing people? Because these people have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So the same thing happened to this household of Gentiles when they believed in Jesus and were baptized. That happened to the disciples of the day of Pentecost. Now Peter gets in trouble back in headquarters. They say, you did what, Peter? You baptized pagans? And Peter says, oh, golly, the Holy Spirit made me do it. He didn't quite say that, but... Pretty much, that was the substance. He says, I saw what was happening. The Holy Spirit fell upon them, this is Acts chapter 11, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We just read that word out of the mouth of Jesus in Acts chapter 1. And then so Peter says, if then God gave them the same gift he gave to us, when we came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to be able to hinder God? When they heard this, they stopped objecting and glorified God, saying, God has then granted life-giving repentance to the Gentiles also. There's so much in those few little verses in Acts chapter 11, verses 15 to 18. So much. 
one of the things I didn't notice for a long time is when Peter says, God gave them the same gift he gave to us when we came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, did Peter and the disciples come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ just after, the, after Pentecost? Well, yes and no. They believed in the Lord before, sort of. But even, even when the Lord's about to ascend, they still don't get it. Uh, in, the, in the version in Matthew's Gospel of the Ascension, it says they, they saw the Lord and they adored him, but they doubted. So they believed, sort of, but not, not with that wholehearted kind of confidence, not with that certainty that the Lord really wants for us. So it really is true that stirring up the gift of the Holy Spirit is really important for the full gift to be experienced. Finally, Acts chapter 19. Paul comes across some disciples in Ephesus, and he asks them a funny question. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, why would Paul ask that question? Probably because he felt like something was missing. What was it? A certain love, a certain joy, a certain presence of the Lord, uh, a certain brotherly love, a certain ability to pray freely. Uh, we don't know what it was. He doesn't say, but he felt something was missing. He wondered if it was the Holy Spirit. So here's their answer. We never even heard that there was a, there is a Holy Spirit. So then Paul says, okay, I understand where you're coming from. How were you baptized? And they say, well, John the Baptist, John the Baptist baptized us. So Paul says, okay, now I know what I need to tell you. So Paul told them about Jesus, and they got baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. So again, every time a new group of converts comes into the church, in the early church, they're very concerned that the fullness of the gift of the Holy Spirit be activated in the lives of new believers. There's another text, this is the last one I'm going to mention, it's from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Paul talks to Timothy and he says, I remind you to stir into flame the gift of God that you have through the imposition of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather of power and love and self-control. So sometimes that flame of the Spirit can die down a little bit. He's probably talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit in ordination here when Paul ordained Timothy as an elder. But it can be applied to all of us. So during this Pentecost season, let's not just make it a nostalgic memory about something that happened 2,000 years ago. Let's ask God to give us a new Pentecost, to stir up in us the grace of the Holy Spirit. John Paul II gave a tremendous meditation on Mary in the upper room. And he said that Mary was more full of the Spirit than any human being ever. She was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, and the Word became incarnate in her. But when she was in the upper room, she wasn't just praying for the disciples. She was also praying for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit for herself, for her new role because a new phase in Mary's life was about to begin. She was become not just the mother of Jesus now, but she was going to be given a role as mother of the church. And she needed a new infusion of the Holy Spirit to equip her for the new mission. So sometimes when things change in our life, sometimes when there's a new phase in our life and uh, we're entering into a new situation work-wise or mission-wise, ask God for more of the Holy Spirit and expect more of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your promise. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your Holy Church. We thank you for these feast days. And Lord, we ask you to remove any obstacles in our life. We want to repent for any ways in which we've grieved your Holy Spirit or, or squenched your Holy Spirit. We want to remove anything in our life that's a block to the working of your Spirit in our life. We repent for any sins. We repent for any lukewarmness. We repent for any carelessness. Lord, help us to seek first your kingdom and your holiness and experience the gift of your Holy Spirit. Amen.